We are, we're starting a brand new series today, a brand new life group series today called The Awakening. And uh, the reason we're emphasizing uh, the life group portion of a life group series is because uh, this is what we know uh, about content that comes from the stage is that transformation really happens when you discuss the information in groups. So whenever you take what we talk about up here and you take it to lunch and you take it into your living room and you take it to the break room and you're able to talk about it, that's when it is able to kind of get into your life and you actually start to see some change. So we encourage each and every person to be in a life group. If you're not in a life group, uh, you can do so by going to the Next Steps area in the lobby. And there are some wonderful volunteers there that would love to get you plugged in. I'm kicking off the series uh, with a story in the Bible of Lazarus. If you don't know who Lazarus is, uh, you're in great company because you're about to learn a lot uh, about Mr. Lazarus. And, and it's found in John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. The Bible says this, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, loved Mary, and loved Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Can we pray for a moment? Father, in these next few moments, I pray that we would come to life more than we ever have before. Lord, we also lift up the Chicago Bears to you. Bless them in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Uh, a couple months ago, um, I had an aunt that passed away. Her and I weren't close, but um, it's, it's interesting when you're at a, a funeral because everyone has a different relationship to the person that's passed. And for me, it was my aunt, but for my mom, it was her sister. So, so me being present at the funeral, for me, wasn't just there to honor the life of my aunt. It was really to be there for mom. So I flew in about midnight, late on a Sunday night, and show up at the funeral. I see my mom, a hugger. I say, Mom, whatever you need, I got you. I'm here for you. Let, let me know anything I can do for you, Mom. I, I'm on it. Mom looks at me straight in the face. She goes, Ryan, I need you to run sound at the funeral. I said, excuse me, Mom? What do you mean you need me to run sound? She's like, I need, you, I need you to run sound here at the funeral. I said, is this a joke? She's like, no, I need you to run sound. I said, okay. My mom hands me a burn CD and says, play track two when the family comes walking in. I said, I'm in the family. <laughs> how, 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 how can I be at two places at once, you know? Now, at, at this church, the sound booth wasn't in the back of the room like it is in this room. Um, it was on the, the stage next to the podium. So I'm at the sound booth while the rest of the family's walking in. My mom said, play that track. Now, you got to understand something. The, the sound booth thing, um, it was just a DVD player. So I had to put the burn CD in the DVD player. And I hadn't done that in a while because um, I'm 31. So um, what, what happened is uh, I, I put the CD in and I forgot that it, there's a little bit of loading time. So the family's walking in in silence and then it started like kicked in halfway as they're coming through. Um, it was a hot mess. And, and like my, my cousin is, is crying because she just lost her mom as she should be. I'm trying to get the CD to work. And I'm like, I'm really sorry, Aunt Sandra. Rest in peace. I love you. I really do honor you. I did not sign up to run sound. I came to like read a Bible verse out loud. So, um, and then my brother's in the crowd and he can see me and I'm trying not to make eye contact with him because I know he thinks it's funny that I showed up to a funeral and they made me run sound at the funeral. So um, then my mom was like, hey, I need you to play track four um, when, after I'm done speaking towards the end of the funeral. So I'm up there just getting ready because I'm, I'm like, I got to play my role as best as I can. And so uh, when I go to play track four, I didn't realize that the DVD player went to sleep 
And then I had to wake it up. So they're all, the, every, all my whole family is waiting for track four, but track four ain't playing because it's got to reload. And so it just continued track two from the walk-in. So now my brother thinks it's really funny and I'm trying not to make eye contact with him and I'm trying to get to track four because I don't want to fail my mom or my aunt. And so um, we're, we're just trying to figure it out. And then um, we was on CP time, which is colored people's time. So we were taking our time. And so, um, so the, the funeral director was like, <laughs> and we was like, we don't even care. So the funeral director just walks in front of the lady that's speaking and she just goes, <laughs> and just escorted us out. I'm like, are we leaving? Is my job done? Like, what's going on? Like, I don't know if you ever, like, like what sort of the etiquette is, you know, for a different funeral. You know, you're there to honor the person. And, you know, but it, if I'm looking at Jesus in this story, I'm like, Jesus, be anything at the funeral, then late. <laughs> at least be at the funeral, Jesus. I mean, on some level, you're just going, how, how are you not even going to show up? Like, you really, really love Lazarus, right? And, and this is... This is what he says. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, Judea is where the funeral is taking place. And this is where the story gets interesting. Uh, but his disciples objected and said, Rabbi, uh, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Let me translate. Hey, Jesus, um, the last time we was in Judea, um, they was throwing stones at you. Now, here's the deal. We always standing next to you. So when people throw stuff at you, most of the time it hit us. Here's the other thing, Jesus. You are all knowing. So you know who's going to throw the rocks, when they're going to throw the rocks. So you duck. We don't have that power. So we just get hit. So are you sure? Like, I know he's your boy and all, but can't you like send the, send the word? You did that with one guy. Your word just went over there and healed his daughter. So can't you just send your word to the cave because I don't want to get hit with no rocks. Like, are you sure you want to go? Like, that's, what, that's what's happening in the story. So then uh, he said, our friend Lazarus is falling asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They're like, they trying to tell Jesus anything not to go get stoned again. They're like, hey, he's just taking a nap. Everybody feel better after a little nappy nap. That's cool. Uh, they, they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. They're like, okay, this is cool. Except there was one guy, this is one of, my, this is one of the funniest verses in the Bible. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too, and die with Jesus. <laughs> Great pep talk, Thomas. Great pep talk. Great pep talk. Phil Jackson, you're doing great, okay? This is awesome. He's like, hey, everybody pack your bags. Let's go die with Jesus real fast. Like, like, like he knows, like, we're, we're, this is not going to be good for us. And then when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Four days late to a funeral. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus this, Lord, if you only had been here, my mother would have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. You ever had a moment where you thought, God, if you would have just, God, if you would have, man, God, you could have intervened here and you did and I don't know if you've ever had a moment with God that you couldn't understand what he was doing. It's like he was doing something behind the scenes that you couldn't fully see, and you're trying to, trying to figure some stuff out. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he, he will rise when everyone else rises. At the last day, the Jews had this belief of the, the resurrection day, like that, that someday long in the future, there will be a day where we all see all the people that we've loved. And then Jesus, he, he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is going, not someday, today, because resurrection here. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. In other words, he says, when you look in the dictionary and look up the word resurrection, you're going to see a picture of my face. <laughs> I am it, and I am here. So if I'm here, whoever I want to get up will get up. And 
Uh, I think when he says, I am the resurrection, the resurrection um, is really a Christian word. It's a church word. We're like, we, un- we understand that. But um, if, if you didn't grow up in church, and maybe that's not a word that really does a lot for you, why don't we substitute the word resurrection? Jesus said, I am the resurrection to I am the comeback. I am the comeback. Now, you might be sitting in your seat thinking, man, I don't even know that I really need a resurrection, but could you use a comeback? Now, here's the deal. Uh, the, the, the gospel's called the good news. And, and sometimes we don't always even see the good news, but can I tell you something? The fact that he is the comeback is the best news you're going to hear all week. Here's why. Because uh, Romans 8, verse 11 says this, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. This is good news. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. So instead of us going the same resurrection power that lived in Jesus lives in you, I want to tell you today, the same comeback that was in Jesus is in you. Here's what that means. That means that's good news for anybody that's lost a marriage. That's good news for anybody that's ever failed. That's good news for anybody that's ever lost a job. For anybody that has ever put a period where God is just putting a comma. Maybe God is just getting started with your life, and maybe you've made calculations about your whole life based off a past mistake. You know what I loved about the video we just watched? It is Ryan, he's got got his arm in a cast, And can you imagine if he put a period on his story right where he says, my mom left me at an airport. Imagine if he put a period on his life. Imagine if he just went, man, that's it. And I'm going to live from that brokenness. I'm going to live from that pain. No, 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 no. He said he went to a summer camp and God took away a period and put a comma and said, but now we've got a life for you. Now he's in a leadership college and his best days are ahead of him because... He's got a comeback that's on the inside of him. And maybe there's some people here that believe that the word divorce is going to somehow define their life. And it's going to sit with you and it pains your kids. But can I tell you, that doesn't have to define your life. Can we remove that period? Now the comma goes. And then and all of a sudden God starts to show up in your life. And can you imagine if everybody in this room and everybody that's watching online decided to just say a prayer and decided to say, Lord, use my life. And I I just got a feeling that that you're not done with it. And and the greatest part about the Lazarus story is we're only halfway through. We're only halfway through of Jesus introducing himself to go, I don't care when the funeral was. I don't care when something that was dead. I don't care when that happened. When I insert it, there is nothing that has happened in your life that Christ can't bring you back from. I know that. Now, and then Uh, The Bible continues. It says, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you only had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. If, if, If you don't know a whole lot about Jesus and you really want to grasp the full theology of who Jesus is, study John chapter 11. John chapter 11 encompasses everything that you need to know about Jesus. It encompasses his full humanity and his full authority as God, and it establishes his leadership, everything you need to know. If, all, if you only had one chapter in the Bible and you had John chapter 11, you would get a full picture of Jesus. Because this is the scripture where we see his full humanity. Jesus knows what he's about to do, but he doesn't excuse his emotional connection from the situation. Jesus is not just this God that wants to fix your life. He embraces it fully and connects with you first. This is not the gospel of you trying to get to Jesus. The gospel is about how Jesus came to you. He meets people where they are so that he can bring them to a better place. The gospel is not, come on, get your life together. The gospel is not, come on, can't you just figure it out? The gospel is about a God that sent his only son to die for you, to connect with you, to understand your pain, understand your darkness, and to bring you out. And you see this Jesus in John chapter 11 going, I understand that there are some people that are hurting, and although I know I have all of the answers and I can do something about it, I'm not going to let that dismiss the fact that I want to feel their pain for a moment. 
This is a beautiful picture of our Jesus. And the Bible tells us that he was deeply disturbed, that he was angry. And then he says, where have you put him? If he was angry, maybe it sounded like, where you put him? <laughs> they told him, Lord, come, come and see. And then when Jesus saw where they put Lazarus, the Bible gives us the shortest verse in the Bible. It says, then Jesus wept. He's standing at the graveside of his friend, and it just pains him that he's gone. But not, not too much pain, just a, a, little bit of, just a little bit of pain. Like, I'm sad, but I am Jesus. <laughs> I'm sad, but I am the resurrection. Like, you might have had a bad week, but that's okay. You got a little comeback in you. So you could cry for a moment, but I need you to get back up. I, we we got to have you alive. We got to get you back on your feet again. It's not over yet. Don't. We got to remove the period. It's just a comma. And the people who were standing nearby said, see, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus like, worry about your own business, okay? <laughs> worry about yourself, okay? Worry about yourself. I'm Jesus. I, I got this. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Girl, would you calm? You worried about how he smelled? You're about to get your brother back, okay? You're about to mess it up, okay? Interrupting Jesus while he's doing his thing. Calm down. <laughs> Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Could you imagine if we just looked at our lives through that lens, that just said, Lord, may my life bring you glory. May my life bring glory to your name. May I not be so consumed with preferred outcomes, but, but can my life just bring glory to your name? And whatever happens, miracles or not, I just pray that it all would bring glory to your name. And then they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so, so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, walking dead. Boy, this is crazy. <laughs> His hands and feet bound in grave clothes. His face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go. It's interesting to me that um, what, when you understand how, how ancient funerals happen, there, there would be, uh, basically they would mummify them. They would wrap them in cloths and, and, and put spices on them to, to deal with the smell. And, and, uh, and so the mummy returns a little bit in, in this scene. And, and it's, it's interesting to me that, he's, that while Jesus' power has brought him to life, he's still stuck. In his grave clothes. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus used his power to bring Lazarus back to life, but he used his friends to set him free. Hey, uh, help your friend get back to life. Help your friend take off his grave clothes because I brought him back to life, but I need you to help him be free. And if you're not in a life group right now, you're missing out because you're trying to get your grave clothes off by yourself, but you're you're stuck. You, you, you need somebody in your life that can help remind you of, of where you're going, not who you've been. Somebody today is going to need to figure out a way to get into a group of people that can help them remove the things that keep them stuck from walking into the life and purposes that God has ordained from them from, from the beginning of time. You, you need to, and here's the I've decided that I wanted to be a person that people can tell me their mistakes and I'm not making pay for it. That people can tell me what's really going on with them and that they're going to be encouraged to make some decisions about their future, not dwell on their past. And, and some of us surround ourselves with people that represent our past and bring up who you used to be, who you used to hang out with and what y'all used to do together. And, and, and there, is, there is this thing that it just keeps you stuck. It keeps you running 
on a treadmill. You're going as fast as you possibly can, and you're exhausted, but you're going nowhere. You're just, you're just tired. You're, you're, just, you're just stuck. Jesus is going to help, help your friend. I, I just decided if I'm going to bring up your past, I'm only going to bring it up to remind you of what God has set you free from. Um, it, it is not a thing for me to bring it up to put shame on you. It's to take shame off you and put you into a position of worship to go, man, you got a lot to be grateful for. Do you remember what you used to be in? We ought to thank God that he rescued you and me. What type of friend are you? You do that for people? What do you do when people talk about their mistakes? What do you do when people tell you about their marriage? And they tell you about their spouse, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. What do you do? Are you a person? Yeah, man, my wife too. I can't believe. Or are you a type of person that goes, man, could you, what would happen if we just made some adjustments? What would happen if, if, if we, like, I don't want you to go, go back there. I don't want you to, to get divorced again. I don't want you, like, can we... Can we start to have some conversations to make sure that we're going to be people in each other's worlds that just go, man, I, I don't want you to keep being stuck. I've been watching your life. I've had a front row seat to it, and you've been running in place, and you look exhausted, and I don't want you to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. You have been made alive in Christ. So live like it. The Bible says this. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, But God is so rich in mercy... And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. The Bible also says this in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. City First Church, you got to know this. Is God has a calling on your life. God's got a destiny for your life, a strategy, a plan, a purpose for your life. You should live a life worthy of that. In, in light of who God has called you to be, I would urge you to go, you know what? It's worth not wearing grave clothes. It's worth me giving up some of the things that I want to hold on to so badly. It's worth giving that up in light of, who, in light of the future that God has for me. It's worth me giving up some, some momentary pleasures to say, you know, I just, I don't want to live with gray clothes. There, there's a girl at, at, at my church in Dallas, and, and uh, we, I, I was talking about a new book I, I just wrote called Unoffendable, and it's all about, like, letting go of offenses and all this stuff, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm, t I'm speaking this message, and afterwards she goes, you were talking to me. You were talking to me. I, I go, well, what's going on? She said, you know, there's this Christian institution. I'm so mad at them because you want to know what? There is not hurt like church hurt because church hurt hurts the most because it's, it's from people you expected not to hurt you. And so when you, when you experience church hurt, you get mad at a bunch of people you ain't never even met. So you look at every Christian sideways thinking, are they going to be like the last one that I encounter? And, and it can really mess with the person. And so she's like, I got a lot of church hurt. And, and tonight I forgave that institution. Tonight I forgave them. Ryan, what you don't know about me is that I was on my way to being a youth pastor. I used to grab the mic. I used to speak, but I just kind of, I kind of lost my way over the last three years. I went down a dark path and I just... I just, I just don't know. And, I, and I, I said this to her. I said, hey, you know that person you just talked about? I'd like to meet her. What do we got to do to get her here? She's like, I don't know. I said, I got an idea. Next month, we're doing open mic night. And I want you to preach for three minutes. She's like, no, 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 no. I, I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to make you. She goes, you can't make me. I go, watch me. If you show up, you're going to be speaking. She's like, she's like, you can't do that. I go, I'm going to have a crowd chanting your name to come to the stage because I can do that, okay? So she's like, oh. And every time I see her, I'm like, hey, open mic night coming. Hey, open mic night coming. So open mic night comes. And she, she's like, Ryan, I can't do it. I go, there's two ways for you to walk on that stage. Willingly. <laughs> it's your life. You, you tell me what you want to do crowds chanting her name. She just kind of walks up there, kind of said, let me tell you something. This girl 
grabbed the mic, and I'm telling you, it was like the presence of the living God walked in the room. And she goes, oh. she, she had some, some thyroid complications, and she, uh, she had found out that she had cancer. And in a couple of services before that, um, I gathered all of our community to pray for her. So she grabs the mic, and she said, hey, my name's Crystal. Um, do y'all remember when y'all, y'all prayed for me? Um, I, I got noticed from a doctor that, that, uh, that I was having some complications and that they found cancer in my blood and, you know, a biopsy here, a biopsy there. And I was just, I was really scared. And so two weeks ago, y'all prayed for me. Y'all remember that whole crowd was like, yeah, yeah, we remember. We prayed for you. She's like, yeah, I went back to the doctor and the doctor took some more blood and, and he looked at the blood. He said, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, for some odd reason, your blood looks like it looks like you have the blood of a marathon runner. She was like, I don't run. <laughs> and and he, he said, uh, and, and something, something else is odd. All the cancer is gone. And, she, and I'm telling you, the, the place erupted, okay? Like, you, you would have thought, like, the Bulls won an a, a NBA championship, like, like, we went crazy, and like, I run over to her, and I just said, my name is Ryan Leak. It is so nice to meet you. This person that was just so alive, I'm like, we need her. Our world needs her. Our world needs you. Awaken. Our world needs you alive. That person that you called to be, man, there's maybe something that's been dormant for a very, very long time. Can we allow Jesus to step into that period and add a comment and go, man, can you imagine what your life could look like now? Oh, man, that's good news for anybody that thought they were a failure because of all their sin and all of the mistakes that they've made. It was, can we just add a comment to that? God's got a whole life for you. And, and, and here's, here's the interesting thing about Ryan and his story. He's like, you know what? My mom left me at an airport, and now every person that's ever felt left, ever felt rejected, now has a chance because Ryan is here. How awesome is that for you? Who are you going to be that for? Who, who in your world that is going, you know what? I'm, I'm down and out. Oh, man, I was on drugs. Man, I'm a, I, I've got an addiction. I've got this. Di like, you want to list off your, your little resume of sin that is holding you back? It's your grave clothes. Can you imagine if you go, man, I, I got this resume, but man, I, I, I met resurrection. I met a comeback and it changed my life for forever. And now everybody that is dealing with everything on your resume gets to get out because you got out and you're going to lead them out. Can you imagine if that was your life? Can you imagine if that was your life? That's the life worthy of a calling because you're alive. I mean, like, really, really, really alive. The, the, the funniest thing about Lazarus' story isn't in John chapter 11. It's in John chapter 12. Now, here's the deal. Most of us have not died and come back, but can you imagine going back to work after you, Lazarus, you know what I'm saying? You walk into the job, they still crying about you. Man, Lazarus was a good dude, man. He was a good dude. He was a good hey, Lazarus, where you come from? Scared the mess out of you. Back, I got to go back to work. Got to eat, okay? Got to eat. Jesus didn't give me a sandwich when he woke me up, okay? Got to eat. Got to feed the fam. You show back up at work. I mean, like, like life gets, everybody's already more. Everybody already thought you dead. You walking around like, nah, I'm, I'm good, man. And all, all, John chapter 12 is it's kind of funny. No, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus. I want to see Lazarus. I got a problem with Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And let me tell you what these brilliant people did. Um, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Hey, if you're going to try and kill somebody, don't kill the only person that's friends with Jesus and has already beat death once. You think he couldn't do it again? Bad plan. I mean, and if you're Lazarus, you're like, you can't scare me to death. I already died. What are you going to do, kill me? So my friend can come back to my second funeral and get me back up from the grave? 
It's amazing what happens to your life when you're really alive. You've been made alive in Christ. You don't live in fear anymore of anybody. You're like, I've been made alive in Christ. I'm friends with Jesus. What can man do to me? I've got salvation in my soul. What are you going to do? You're going to try and kill me? Great plan. You're going to have to come up with something else. I get the, uh, I get the wonderful privilege of, of traveling and talking to schools and, and businesses and churches and um, and I tell the story of when I traveled for the Phoenix Suns and the project called Chasing Failure, and I ask everybody the same question, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? So I've had thousands of people tell me uh, what their real dream is, and people tell me the craziest stuff. They be like, Ryan, I'm a changed world, man. I want to do this. I want to do that. You think I'm going to do it? Nah. Then why are you telling me to do it? Uh, because when you talk about your dreams, you should see yourself in the mirror. You should see what you look like when you talk about your dreams. It's so much better than the person that simply talks about their nine to five job that they care nothing about living in mediocrity. So yeah, I would rather talk to this person that's about to fail because maybe the person that's about to fail is living for the first time. And maybe this person that is telling me about their really, really scary dream, now they need God. They need resurrection power. They, they need an almighty God to pull it off and I go, why would I tell you not to sign up for a life where you really believe that you need him? Wouldn't you want to live that way too? I would. Oh man, I, I see a, a, a community of believers in this room and watching online that are just going, I'm alive. I'm, I'm going for, there's nothing that can stop me because I have been made alive in Christ. And, and this is a prayer that I, that we're gonna be praying over the next four weeks. And, and I, think, I think we all should, just, and maybe you wanna take a picture, maybe you wanna write it down, but it's this. Jesus, I pray that you would do something new in my heart and awaken me to the more you have for me. Jesus, I pray that you would do something new in my heart and awaken me to the more you have for me. Can you imagine if this was your prayer? And, and, and here's the deal. As you pray it, I hope that your prayer life isn't just about what you're saying to God, but perhaps what he might say back to you. And I hope and pray that maybe something is revealed to you that you never even knew about yourself. I pray that on, on some level, that as you start praying this prayer, that the Lord would begin to remove shame off of your life that he would begin to remove the grave clothes, remove all of the things that have kept you stuck, to remove all of the things, all of the excuses that you have given him for why you can't be who he's called you to be. I pray that in those moments that he would reveal that plan and that that plan would be so grand and so amazing that it would be worth saying no to something that's mediocre. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give each and every person the opportunity perhaps to make Jesus the Lord of their life for the first time. Or maybe uh, you've been away from church for a while, or maybe you were brought here by a friend and, and uh, you used to be a Christian, or you, you would say you used to be a Christ follower, and you say, man, I, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Whether it is your first time, second time, or third time, or whatever time it is for you, I want to give everybody an opportunity to say, you know what? Jesus needs to be the Lord of my life. I want that comeback, that resurrection power to be in me. If that's you with no one looking around, would you just slip up your hand and say, yes, I want to receive Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands up there. That's awesome. Is there anybody else? I see your hand, miss. That's great. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. That's great. Hey, can we all pray this prayer together as, as a family and community of believers? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. Your blood washes me clean. Forgive me for all the mistakes I've made. And I ask now for a fresh start in you. Give me new life. And I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their life to Christ? It is literally the best decision you have ever made in 
your life. And, and, and here's what we want you to do as the next step. If you raise your hand, we want you to go to the next steps area and tell somebody, say, hey, I made that decision today. We want to put some materials in your hands that can help you uh, navigate what your journey needs to look like now that you are saved. Once again, can we put our hands together for every person that gave their life to Christ today? Uh, also, if, uh, if you want to join a life group, uh, you can also do that at, at the Next Steps booth. If you want to start one, um, maybe, maybe that's the thing that God's been urging you to do that maybe you've been putting on the back burner. And um, maybe today is the day that you sign up and say, hey, I'd love to, to get trained to do that. And, and the way we've, we've even made life groups, we give you like a little box. You, you can start a life group at your job. Like, like we, we've done a lot of the legwork for you. Jair's film, um, a, a great life group series on this. And it's kind of a, a plug and play. So don't be intimidated by that thought. And if you want to start a life group or join a life group, you can do so at the Next Steps table. Uh, Jared will be back to continue um, the Awakening series next week. And uh, City First Church, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Have a fantastic weekend. And um, our prayer team is available up here in the front for prayer. Have a great weekend.